dealing with men good night uh, Kiara as long as we're dealing with men there's going to be times when excessive behavior excessiveness excess happens and uh, whenever there's a new movement of God there is always some crazy individual or group of individuals that takes that thing far to the right or the far to the left what I'm talking about tonight is staying in the middle of the road. Balance. Stability. Correct proportion. Even distribution. Balance. It means that you're not going overboard with this thing. 
and you're not staying, there's no such term, on the board with this thing, under the board. You're not going over the board, you're not going under the board. What has happened to apostles and apostolicity is, the few people that have a biblical view of the subject of the apostle, they are so scared of status quo and the rejection with which the church had treated this ministry gift and subject matter that they tiptoe around the tulips. It's like walking on eggs. They don't want to say too much because they don't want to offend anybody. And they don't want to say too little because they don't want to offend the Lord. So they're caught in a quandary. But what I'm talking about is taking this thing to the level it's supposed to be taken all the way and yet maintaining a balanced head. You don't go crazy with it because what I have seen is that they are excessive even among the few who call themselves apostles. One of the excess is that a lot of them are not. There's no way that guy, that gal, absolutely no way. There is no obvious gift. There is no... It, there's no function. It's, there's just nothing there. And uh, a couple of them are really and genuinely born again. A few of them are sure that they have something going on when indeed and in fact there's nothing going on and that's just by the process of observation. And uh, the, the more you observe them, the more you know this person doesn't have what they're talking about. And some of them don't even know what they're supposed to have. That's, that's one of the excess. Is that the level of ignorance is, here you are proclaiming yourself to be this thing. You don't even know what you're talking about. At least you should know from the text, from the scriptural point of view, what you're supposed to be representing. But you don't know. And yet there you are claiming this title. Have you seen what I talked about last night? How many of them got killed for just, the, just being that in the kingdom of God? They got killed. Only John made it through to his ripe old age. Everybody else got their head chopped off, got all kinds of ways of dying very cruelly and very early in their lives. And so what I'm going to be dealing with tonight is the excesses that relates to, uh, to the apostle. Because you've got to understand, now that it's something that's quite new, having apostles in the church is a totally new thing. Even though it's biblical and it's been there as long as the scripture has been written. But now that a modicum of understanding is coming to the subject matter, what Satan does, he throws all kinds of half-baked, half-scald, half-tailed men and women who just love the fact that the Bible says apostles are first. And they think that by calling themselves apostles, they have the right to lord it over God's people. But I'm saying tonight, and I'm saying it loud and clear, it doesn't matter who calls themselves an apostle. They don't have any right to lord it over you as a child of God. You don't know them from Adam. They could call themselves the queen of Sheba for all you know. You don't know where Sheba is and you don't care for no queen. Are you feeling a brother? And some so-called apostles and, and archbishops and all these big fancy titles, you ought to treat them like you treat another brother in the church. They say they're saved. All right. I give you the benefit of the doubt. But your, your gift is not going to so impress me that I'm going to allow you to be extraordinarily obnoxious just because you claim to have a gift. Because I have found that gifted men and women can be extraordinarily obnoxious and they think that because God uses them and the anointing flows through them that it gives them the right to be an obnoxious bully. And people are scared of them, you know. I don't want him to say anything because life and death are in the power of the tongue. You got a tongue too. Life and death are in the power of your tongue too. Any person who tries to frighten you that they will curse you and you'll never see your way. Let them know they cannot curse what God has blessed. You're a blessed child of God. You got born again. No man can curse what God has blessed. Who God blessed, no man can curse. So once you're born again, you become uncursable. What are you scared of? Oh, but he's a mighty man of God. And what are you? A weak woman of God, a weak man of God. God doesn't have weak children. It's all in the state of mind. And so, the apostolic movement has some 
some potential extremes where people can go overboard with this thing. And one of the overboard ways that I see it going is that people who call themselves apostles assume that the rod of apostolicity gives them the right to tell you what to do and to boss the church around. Look, even though you're an apostle, even though you're an apostle, you go to a church, that pastor of that church, he's in charge. He's in charge of you while you're there with your apostle self. And you have no right nor jurisdiction to try to be boss over that man by saying, God raised up apostles and he set them in the church first. Are you feeling it, brother? First doesn't mean the most obnoxious member of the body. Are you feeling that now? Now I know that sometimes people get offended with what I say because I see them complaining to Facebook and they take the liberty to cut the program and you know delete it off the, off the page. But my job is to tell you the truth, to rightly divide the scripture and not to be afraid of you. And if you get offended, you're going to call up the, the Facebook police and they're going to come after me and stuff like that. You go ahead, but I'm still going to tell the truth anyhow. We have to get this thing right because when it explodes and it's going to explode, apostles are going to come out of the cave like nobody's business. I say so, I say so, I say so. Why is that? Because we, we apostles in this day and time, we understand the Genesis principle which the apostles in the past did not quite seem to get. And what is that? Like produce like. You produce after your kind. I cannot be an apostle and I'm not producing apostles. What kind of apostle is that? The tree produces its kind of fruit. Mango trees produce mangoes. Orange trees produce oranges. Pine trees produce pine. I said tree. You know what I'm talking about. Like produces like. You cannot be an apostle and not produce any. Come on, y'all. And so what we are going to do, we apostles, what we are going to do, we are going to mass produce. Now, you know that it's not us that's doing it because these gifts are given by God. It's God's are portfolio and jurisdiction to do that but unless they know how shall they hear without a preacher somebody's got to preach it and that's why i'm here i'm here to preach it that apostles are supposed to produce apostles no corn produces one corn it produces at least two thousand ears of corn two thousand uh corns on that on that cob corn on cob one seed produces at least two thousand corns on that cob if a corn can produce thousands and a, a mango tree can produce millions of mangoes during its lifespan, why are preachers not producing anything and every time they die, then you hear them talk about, I wonder who the mantle dropped on. That's nonsense. That's unscriptural. That's unbiblical. There's no way that principle is set forth anywhere in the scripture. Not because it happened to Elijah and Elijah you're going to make that a pattern for behavior. The devil is a liar and so is his mother-in-law and all of his stepchildren. Like produces like. You don't die and then produce when you die. You give, you bring forth children when you're alive. Are you feeling a brother now? Oh, glory to God. So while you are alive, people like you should be produced by you. Why aren't you producing? And the reason they're not producing is, number one, they have no idea that they're supposed to produce, so it's biblical ignorance. And number two, they want to be the only dog in the pound. The only dog in the kennel. Nobody else must be named apostle. Nobody else must have my title. Uh, because now you have two apostles. And if, if the Bible says first apostles, and you've got two of them, then who's the first one? So they're always jockeying for position to be top dog and mark daddy. Preachers are some of the people with the brittlest egos on the planet. Preachers. They are egomaniacal. They are very brittle. And they are very afraid of other people's gifts and abilities and talents and anointings. And whatever they have to say to tarnish your reputation and to make you less than themselves, they will say it and they will do it. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Preachers lie on preachers all the time or they drop little hints and innuendos. Oh, you know, she's very anointed, but you got to watch her because whenever she comes, trouble comes. And people start to back off because they don't want trouble. I thought you were anointed as a more than a conqueror. How are you going to be more than a conqueror if you didn't conquer anything with your scared self? <laughs> the apostles did not mince their words <laughs> I must be called to that office Because I don't mince my words 
I just give it up by the chunks. Are you ready to go? So here we go. There will be a complete restoration of apostles in the church in these 2020, 2021. A complete restoration of apostles to their full recognition, to their full acceptance, and the level of powerful ministry. There will be a restoration of apostles to their place and position within the body of Christ. The restoration of apostles and apostolicity is just a given. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm telling you as my name is what it is, it's coming and it's coming in hot. Nobody's going to stop this. No church, no political maneuvering of church men will stop it. And they will not be able to manipulate and control it and make it do what they want it to do when they want it to flow. Some people only want your gift to flow if they invited you to their church, it must flow in their church so that they get the benefits of it. But if it is flowing in another man's congregation, they're they not too they're not feeling that. It, they, they will even say, I doubt whether it's the Holy Spirit. I think it's a demon that's using that guy. You know, many people have accused me of having a demon. How come when you come all this kind of spiritual activity happen, but other preachers come and nothing ever happened? I'm not concerned about what other preachers come. I come, I bring it when I come. Name of Jesus. I owe those people some demonstrations of supernatural power because i am claiming that i'm a carrier of god and if i'm carrying god i should be able to spread some god up in here and god is a supernatural entity a supernatural being and if you come and you're bringing god then supernatural things are supposed to happen christ is in me the hope of glory i don't pray him down i don't shout him up i carry him wherever i go i'm a carrier of jesus christ and he's a powerful being oh my first Rock a shocker. And so, there will be a complete restoration. I'm balancing this thing here because what some people feel is that there are going to be one and two over here, one and two over there, one and two over there. I'm balancing it by telling you there's going to be a deluge of apostles rising. A deluge, a, a downpour, a gush, thunderous rain. A stormy rain of apostles is coming. They're coming. And they're coming in hot. They're coming in fast. That's why I'm giving you the balance now. So when they come, you know how to back them up and tell them, hold your horses there, Rev. I know you're anointed and everything else, but you're not the leader of this church. We got a pastor here for that. So stop talking like that, like you're the big dog. Calm yourself. You're not the leader here. And some apostles need to be told that because they come in with this big weight of anointing and they do carry it, but they carry it as if, it ought to be bowed down to. And that's not the way to carry it. You carry your gift in humility. Don't strut over me here. You're not in charge of me. I'm the pastor here. I don't say that. I have never said that more than once or twice. But sometimes some preachers come to your church and they act like you're just a dumb fool. And they come to show you what, what has got to be done. Well, bro, I ain't no dumb fool. And you're not here to show me anything. I just asked you to come here to hear the, for the people to hear a different voice. But I got stuff up to wazoo. I'm just doing your courtesy by inviting you to come. But I got messages in me, man. Come on now. Come on. Don't strut over me and try to lord it over me and pretend that I'm a dumbo. There are times when we have a preacher drop by in church. And I ask him, say, Rev, you got a word? And most times they say, yes. Yeah. Well, if you got a word, you can preach today. It doesn't mean I don't have a message. But some of them get the wrong idea. It's as if they rescued you that day. And they say things like, you know, I'm glad I came today. The Lord sent me here because, you know, the, 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 the man of God didn't quite look like he was prepared. What a stupid thing to say. Because you're not coming back with a statement like that. You're not fit. You're, you're minimizing the man who gave you a platform. You have lost your mind. And you have just lost uh, an invitation and a pulpit that should have been open to you for the future. That statement alone has shown that you're disqualified to handle any kind of an elevation with your crazy self. Are you feeling a brother? I can challenge anybody. Anytime you see me in a church service, I've got a sermon ready to preach. Anytime, anytime. I could just wake up on my bed and, and somebody come to the house and drag me to a convention. And I didn't have no message written down on a piece of paper. You trust me when I tell you this. I got a message that will rock the house. 
A Mickey, Mickey, Mickey Mouse rock the house. A Mickey. <laughs> I'm a carrier of the word of God. And this COVID just got me home studying more, reading more, preparing more so that when the COVID is no more, I got word in me, bro. Are you feeling it, brother? And if, if you as a preacher out there, you come to where I am the pastor of the church and I give you an opportunity to preach, it doesn't mean I don't have a sermon. Don't ever say, you know, the pastor was not quite ready, so the Lord has sent me here to preach because you will not preach back after that day. That'll be your one and only day with your mad self. <laughs> you just prove that you don't know how to handle a little bit of a blessing. I open my door for you. you you're throwing mud at me. You're throwing shade on a brother. I know shade when I see it. I know shade when I see it. You don't, sometimes you don't even have to say anything. You just have to give me that look, that facial expression, and I know what you're doing. And people who have been around me for a while, they know what you're doing too. And they will tell me, Rev, he was throwing shade. I said, I know, but it wasn't too much. <laughs> look, ministry has a lot of inside, behind the scene things that you, you might not know about, but we observe stuff and we've been in it long enough to know when people are not quite ready for the big stage, for the big leagues. Are you feeling it, brother? So let me say that again. There will be a complete, and it's happening now, restoration of apostles. to their. F there will be a restoration one. There will be full recognition. Full recognition because the church will be taught who an apostle is and what they do and why you need them and stop fighting them. So there will be full restoration, full recognition. It's one thing to be restored and you put on a side as some little... Uh, some little thing in a, in a zoo, some little quirk of curiosity that people want to, oh, that's what an apostle looks like. Mm -hmm. And they ignore you. The apostles of today are being ignored by the church. I've got enough of being ignored. I start my own churches. I'm not waiting on you for an invite. When I come, you don't invite me. I set up a stage somewhere and go preach and start a church. Tell them when I come back, I'm coming here. Are you feeling a brother? So instead of depending on them, you're so busy with the churches that you've started that you don't have time for anybody. You're too busy building your own uh, kingdom works for the honor and glory of God. And if you're an apostle, make full proof of your ministry. Start churches like nobody's business. Don't wait. Because when the invitations dry up after you have been demonstrating power and pastors get nervous when you come around town, they will start talking to each other and they will shut you out of their pulpit when they shut you out, you must never be shut out. Now that you're shut out, you're shut in with the churches that you have started. And you're doing great things for the honor and glory of God. Stop being afraid of people not wanting to invite you again. It's their loss if they don't invite you again. It's their loss. You should bring such value to the table that even when they don't invite you and they know you're in tongue, they feel the loss. They wish they had had the guts to have you at least for one night. Because they know you have something to say. When I tell people when I come to church, I didn't come here just to say something. I come here because I've got something to say. And they look at each other real nervous. <laughs> oh, rocker shocker. I, I just got that level of boldness, man. I, I ain't scared of nobody. The devil is a liar. I'm hoping the day will come when the best preachers in the world would be on a stage. I just want to get the last night after everybody has shut their stuff. And I'll tell them, you ain't heard nothing yet until I get up there. <laughs> I'm bold like that. I ain't scared of you. So apostles will be, will be, there will be a complete restoration of apostles to their full recognition. So there's restoration, there's recognition, and full acceptance. Acceptance meaning people will open up their doors for them to come and minister. And then there will be powerful ministry, signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost. Powerful ministry, and they will be placed and positioned within the body of Christ. Placed in their rightful spot in the body of Christ, to the glory of God. The, the second thing is, the new generation of apostles, they will not be sterile. They will not be non-productive. They will not be non-generational. They will be able to reproduce after their kind. They will be able to reproduce they will be able to mass reproduce after their kind. They will be able to mass reproduce. Hey, 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 hey. <sighs> after they, hey. <sighs> after they, Cabo Saka, yeah. Hey. What just happened there? Somebody's praying. I know somebody else's prayer because I didn't do much praying today. I prayed, but not too much. 
And the kind of anointing that's hitting here, this is somebody else's prayer. You've got to know to admit that, you know, you didn't put in much today. Don't let people feel you're always all up in Jesus' face, fasting and praying. Sometimes the devil keeps you so busy you didn't have time for all that stuff. And yet the anointing flows. When I am weak, then I am strong. But I know that somebody prayed. Somebody prayed for me. Had me on their mind. Took the time and prayed for me. Well, I'm so glad they did. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad somebody prayed for me. Somebody prayed for me. Clap, clap. Had me on their mind. Clap, clap. Took the time and prayed for me. Well, I'm so glad they did. <laughs> Pastor Julian, I know you pray for me. He said, Lord, this man is absolutely crazy. Can you keep him a bit sane? <laughs> Why does he laugh so much? The joy of the Lord is my strength, man. The other thing, you know, when I got picked out as an apostle in the kingdom of God, the man who picked me out, and this guy has 7,000 churches that he's in charge of. 7,000. And he said, one of the ways the Lord is going to use you, and he started laughing, he says, you're going to make people laugh a lot. You're going to be filled with humor, but you're also going to have a tremendous praying ministry and ministry in the Word. You're going to have ministry in the Word, you're going to have a praying ministry, and you're going to have a humorous... You will make people laugh. They will think that you are a stand-up comedian sometimes. <laughs> and he was right. He was right. He was right. And the, the, the time when he was telling me that, I used to be a sour puss, you know, sour the hour, the serious man of God. You know, just serious, serious, bringing the thunder cloud over my head when I come. And somehow, after he spoke and prayed, that thing was released. I've been laughing ever since. <laughs> and about 12 years have gone since then. 12, 13 years have gone. And I'm still laughing. And I'm not going back to that sour guy. I like this guy. I like him better. His joy makes me laugh. Ha, ha, ha. His joy makes me laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha. His joy makes me laugh. Ha, 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 ha. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh boy, all right, all right, catch yourself. Come on now. Okay, behave, behave. Behave. Hallelujah. The new generation of apostles will not be sterile. They will not be non-productive. They will be ge generational. They will have the Genesis principle and ability to declare that every seed shall produce after... Hey! shall produce after its kind. Glory to God. Glory to God. One of the sad things about the apostles of the past, and I'm, I'm not talking about Paul and those guys. I'm talking about the previous generation from, from my day going back. Those apostles, or Robert's days, those men. The sad fact about those men is that they did not receive the revelation and anointing for reproducing other apostles and prophets. Or Roberts was trying with his school, and he basically got it, almost got it right. And then when he died, people quarreling that he left his mantle with them, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's because they don't understand the Genesis principle. Brethren, mantles are not to be handed to one person. The person with the gift is supposed to reproduce that gift, mass produce that gift, by the gift and grace of God. It is God who gives men. He gives men. He gives gifts to the body of Christ. And these gifts, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, now notice what I'm saying again. I'm not talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the gifts of men. The apostle is a gift. The prophet is a gift. The pastor is a gift. The evangelist is a gift. The teacher is a gift. And these are supposed to work to produce men and women who will do the work of the ministry. So each of these five ministry gifts are supposed to reproduce after their kind. What does that mean? The teacher is supposed to produce other teachers like himself. As he is teaching, apart from 
Now pay attention to what I'm saying here. Apart from the dissemination of information, apart from giving information, apart from grounding the people in the Word of God, apart from widening their knowledge base of Scripture, what has to happen when a teacher, when his gift is in full flight, there will be teachers sitting in the audience. I'm not talking about high school teachers or, or college teachers or what. Teachers in the body of Christ who are gifted in that area as well. And his deep, the teaching deep, the teaching depth that he carries, is supposed to call out their deep, their teaching gift, their teacher that's inside of them. His deep, the teacher, is supposed to call to deep. Deep is supposed to call to deep and he's supposed to produce teachers like himself. Of, of, of similar caliber because like is supposed to produce like. Good night, Sister Desri, Desri Lane. Y'all say good night, Sister Desri Lane. Trinidad and Tobago in the house. To God be the glory. Sheila Barrington, uh, Guyana in the house. Glory to God. Kiara Fabiana, the United States and Philippines in the house. Uh, Sister Sheila, that's Sister Desri. That's your friend from back, back in the day. <laughs> I know y'all know each other, so say hi. Sometimes I'm looking at the names and I can tell what nation these people are from. Julian Edwards, Jamaica and Canada. Shiniki Watson, Essequibo. Glory to God. And so, we have received the revelation for reproducing and producing, for producing and reproducing the anointing that we carry. Where did we get a revelation from? From Well, Esibum said that, and it's a Genesis principle indeed, that like will produce like, that the seed will produce after its kind. But I didn't see it in that way that he's saying it, but I'm saying it loud and bold, that's the way it is. You're supposed to produce after your kind. Don't you know liars, if they get together with other people, those people begin to lie just like them? Liars produce liars, thieves produce thieves, junkies produce junkies. Godly people are supposed to produce godly people. Prophets are supposed to produce prophets. Apostles produce apostles. Come on, y'all. And they produce them in a, in, a, in, a, in a magnificent way. Not one here, one there, one next year. Lots of them. Sakobo shatan apaka yandere. Power of the living God, man. Now listen to me and listen well. The anointing for reproducing thousands of apostles just as the prophetic movement produced thousands of prophets is coming. It's coming. And one of the excesses that you have to watch for, now pay attention here, because a lot of people are not apostles, when the apostolic movement kicks in and takes off, what they will want to do is to have conferences and charge a fee for people to come. And they're not going to teach you anything about the apostle because you're not going to get this, this teaching free. So everything becomes pay to hear, pay to listen, pay to learn. So you're paying to go to church now. That's an excess. Freely we have received and freely we're supposed to give. You can't charge people everything to teach anything or to teach everything. This message of the apostle needs to be taught. It needs to be taught in a balanced manner from scripture. It needs to be taught in a hurry. It needs to be mass taught. Mass taught. Meaning teach it everywhere, every day, every Sunday, for, for the entire year. Everybody and their mother and their dog is supposed to be teaching about this apostle's gift and office and they're not supposed to have conferences where they charge that's why i'm so happy for this zoom and live you can't charge nobody nothing and very few people respond when you ask them to give to anything i've been teaching now uh about 10 years on this uh live on facebook and and if i've got five people that send anything at all it's a lot five you heard me God's people are as mean as a junkyard dog. They say, oh, good preaching, Rev. Bless the Lord for you. I'm so happy. My eyes open to a lot of things, you know. A lot of questions answered and da-da-da-da-da. But they're not going to give a dime. And they don't have no church that they're giving to. And some of them got born again what's in the program. Some got delivered what's in the program. Still not a dime they wouldn't give to, to the cause of Jesus Christ. They know I'm building churches all over the place. And they have not given a dime. Well, they have. When we had that... Uh, that uh, Zoom live shalom for India and, and, Pak and Sri Lanka. I think we raised enough money for six or seven churches. I'm going to have to find out the figures and come back to you on that. But they gave that night. But apart from that, just a few people once in a while. And a few people regular. But it's, it's not five people. Can you believe that? It's not five. 
What is that? How could you have eight or nine hundred likes and messages and, and, and comments and uh, two, three people? <laughs> I'm telling you, you preachers, let me tell you something. Find a job that you can do outside of ministry because some people will make you starve to death if they have their way. If they have their way, they'll starve you to death. And the same people will give to some false prophet, send him thousands of dollars every month. I don't get that. I don't get that. I got people that sit in my pew week after week, week after week, week after week, and send thousands to other preachers in, the, in America and never give me a thousand yet, not yet. What is that? And I've been around for two, three years. Come on, y'all. Oh, let me get off of that now. Got to balance that. And so you should not... You should not charge the people at these conferences and if they don't come, they're not going to be taught. If they don't pay these big dollars, they're not going to be taught. That's, that needs to be reined in and we need to balance that out. Are you feeling it, brother? Yes. Anyone <clears throat> with the basic knowledge of God's gift and ministry, they know that one human being cannot give another person a divine gift or ministry. You can't give the gift of apostleship to anybody. That's God's, that's God's area. It is the Lord who distributes these gifts. For to one is given by the Spirit. For to one is given by the Spirit. Not by the pastor. Not by the rev. Now you can impart based on a revelation from the Lord. Are you feeling it, brother? Or by spiritual maturity and observation. You can tell what people are. And sometimes they don't know. And you got to tell them because they will never know unless you tell them. The, and the trick is a lot of people will know. They will see that thing on them and know what it is. But they will never tell them. Because as long as that individual walks in ignorance, they can be able to manipulate them and they can be able to control them. And so sometimes you see a prophet and you got to tell that person, come here, come, 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 come. Let me tell you something. I don't care who has told you whatever before, but I'm telling you, I see in you a prophet of God. You're not going to prophesy once in a while. You walk in the office of a prophet. You carry that. You are a prophet from head to toe. Many times they just laugh at me and, you know, uh, yeah, Rev, uh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. Rev, you've been on something. You're smoking weed. And then sometimes years later, somebody else sees the gift and tells them again. But if that person is light-skinned and has blue eyes and blonde hair, they believe right away. But if I tell them, Oh, no, Rev, you couldn't have seen that. You just, you just smoked too much weed. They never believe. Look, I brought prophetic words, and I'm not a prophet. I brought prophetic words to people for the last 30 years. And uh, I've got one lady, one lady, that she, well, she is convinced that I'm some extraordinary prophet. One lady. And if I tell her something, she believes. But the rest of people, they just laugh. They smile. Oh, okay, all right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They dismiss it. 99 of 100 people dismiss it. Even people that know me, they still dismiss it. All right, Rev. God bless. Have a nice day. <laughs> what is that? I can't get over that one. Like, come on. Take me seriously, please. And they start laughing. They say, Rev, nobody takes you seriously. And then when it comes to pass, he said, Rev, you know somebody else had told me that? I think that person's mouth caught me. He said, what about my mouth? <laughs> you just got to roll with the punch. Eh? Just take it as it comes. Human beings, the point I'm making, human beings cannot give another person a divine gift of ministry because the very nature of the gift is divine. And since we are not divine, we cannot give divine gifts. That's God's area of expertise. But as a child of God, he can tell you, this is what that one has. This is what that one has. This is what that one carries. <clears throat> I walked into an office one time, a church office, the headquarters of a church. And I saw this lady walk in. And immediately the Lord said, she's a pastor. So I turned to her and I said, lady, excuse me. I don't mean to intrude in your day. I know you're not here for this, but the Lord just told me that you're a pastor. The woman laughed. She had to run to the washroom. <laughs> Nearly beat herself. She was laughing. And while she was laughing and went to the washroom, the, 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 the superintendent of the organization came out 
And he said, what happened? I said, the Lord just told me that that lady just came in is a pastor. And he said, which lady? And I told him. And little after that, she came out. She was still laughing. And she told him, she said, uh, 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 Bishop, you, can you believe what Reverend Ezimum that told me? He said, tell me. And she told him. He said, we were discussing that just a few months ago, myself and, and all of the men who meet, the highest ranking men in the church. And we came to the conclusion, sister, that you are called to be a pastor. And she was shocked. She said, why nobody ever told me that? She said, well, the Lord is telling you now. I said, all right, <clears throat> I'm going to test this thing. If the Lord has really called you to be a pastor, and I told somebody, stand up behind her. I said, why do you want somebody to stand behind me? I said, because I'm going to blow in your face and the Lord will knock you to the floor as a sign that you are called to be a pastor. She said, what? You can't do that. And I went, <laughs> man, she felt like a ripe mango hit by a two by four. Fell on her face. <clears throat> Thank God the floor was carpeted. And she stayed on for a good, about a good 10, 15 minutes. She got back up and she staggered and fell again. <laughs> Two is the number of witness. <laughs> oh boy. She fell again a second time. Then she crawled and found the chair. She sat on that chair. And she, she was acting like she was drunk, like she had some liquor. Drunk as Pepe Le Pew. Guess what she's doing now? <laughs> Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father who's in heaven. She's a pastor now, and she's pretty good at it. She's got that. She's, she's a pastor. She just cut out for that thing. Hand in glove, successfully pastoring a church today. And every time she sees me, she bursts out laughing again. And I just look at her like, oh, ye of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy. She believed me now. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Nobody can make saints into fivefold ministers if God has not called them. Now, a lot of apostles, when they come, they come, they bring this brash, brazen attitude that they can make you an apostle by laying their hands on you and imparting to you. It no go so. That's not the way it goes. They can stir up the gift that's in you. By impartation that comes by revelation, like that, that uh, last, last weekend, I did an impartation, but two of the people that were on every night, they went through the entire study, and then on the night of impartation, they couldn't make it. I just couldn't leave out those two people, so I did it another night, and then one of them couldn't make that. I did it another night just to accommodate those folks. That's why I did it three nights. To accommodate to, didn't the Bible said Jesus went out, left the 90 and 9 and went for the one? And guess what? One of them is called to be an apostle. And I suspect the second one too, but I'm still, I'm still watching. <laughs> Power of the living God knocked somebody else to the floor. Mm. Those that have a divine calling, they're called to this ministry. They can be taught, that's why I'm teaching. They can be activated, the gift can be stirred up. They can be trained, told how and when to, how to flow, what to do, when to move, when to stop. They can be mentored, they can be matured in their calling and their gift. Even though they have the gift. Paul said, Paul called to be an apostle. Uh, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, called to be. Called to be. Then by the time he gets to 2 Corinthians, Paul an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first stage of his apostolicity, he was called to be. In the second phase, he had become what he was called to be. And a lot of apostles right now are just in that stage of being called to be. They haven't matured in it yet. They haven't come to the full understanding and level of how to flow in that level of power as yet. They are becoming what they are called to be. Oh, glory to God. And so when you see the gift in them, then they need to be activated, they need to be taught, they need to be trained, they need to be mentored, they need to be matured in their gifts and calling. Somebody who has been flowing in that thing for years and years and years has to show them the ropes and stop being afraid of people's abilities and gifts and talents. Let them flow and let the blow, blow, blow. <laughs> Some people think that's a political statement I just made. In a certain country, let the blow, blow, blow are words used by the opposition party 
But I was using that before the opposition party took that. And so now whenever I say that they think I'm a member of the opposition party, I don't belong to none of them. None of the two. Not the one in power, not the one out of power. Oh yes. Sometimes what you really do as an apostle is activate the gift. And they think that activation is impartation. Why do they think that? Biblical ignorance. They don't know and they don't know what they don't know until somebody tells them what they don't know. That's why I'm telling them what they don't know. It is not impartation that you just... You didn't put a gift on them. You activated something that was already there. A lot of what people call impartation is really activation. Kasa, ye kemu. Glory to God. Something is happening. Usually, you know, when I'm ministering, I speak in English all the time. Over the years, I've trained myself to not speak in tongues in the public. But something is just bubbling over. Jesus' love keeps bubbling over. And it just gushes out like a, a machine gun. Rat -a -tat -a -tat -tat. And I'm trying here, I'm trying to hold it back, you know, trying to be cute and poised and, you know, speak in English. Don't be a barbarian. People hear you in tongues, they wouldn't know what you're saying. They'll think you've lost your mind and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they activate the gift. They don't impart the gift. Most of the times what is happening is an activation of what is already there. It's not an impartation. But a lot of preachers don't know the difference. And if you tell them the difference, they'll get mad at you. Say, how you know that? <laughs> oh, glory to God. Listen again. I'm still on balancing this thing. Uh, God's apostles are going to come forth. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. They are going to come forth. But when they come forth, what you got to look for now, false apostles. Whenever God is doing something... Satan will bring an original photocopy. <laughs> the fake, the fraud, the shyster. The wolf in sheep clothing. The force ripe apostles. The went apostles. They were not sent apostles. They are went apostles. Self-made apostles. Self-appointed apostles. Man-made apostles. Man-appointed apostles. Father-in-law appointed apostles. His son-in-law He's trying to be a preacher. He's a father-in-law. He makes him an apostle and tells him to go around the church and strut his stuff and act like he's a cat's meow and a dog's bow wow. And the most impressive thing about him is his suit, his belt, and his shoe. He can't preach to save himself with his raggedy sermon and his raggedy absence of anointing. It's only because his father-in-law is the bishop that people tolerate his sorry donkey. And they don't like it when he comes because he doesn't bring anything when he comes. Because he doesn't have anything to bring. He's a straw weight when he's supposed to be a heavy weight. Name of Jesus. He's going on titles and not on office. Going on, on titles, man-made titles, and not on gift. The poor fellow couldn't cast a demon out. And if one manifests, he'll be the first one to run helter-skelter out of that church. If you're still afraid of demons, I doubt your Christianity. And you're a preacher. You're something else. You're a creature, but you're not really a preacher. There will be false apostles. I'm balancing this teaching now. As the true ones rise up, false ones will, will, will impose themselves there to create confusion and to create a disaster so that the name of the Lord will blaspheme. Then you will have those apostles that are immature. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the Lord will show you something. It doesn't mean you have to address it. It does not mean you have to address it. Not every vision you have, you got to run up on the pulpit and tell the people what you saw. Shut your mouth. You can't tell me that. Shut up. It's not everything God shows you that you have to tell everybody what you saw. Some of it is for you. Some of it, like Mary, you hide these things in your heart until the fullness of time. Sometimes the Lord will tell you to tell a particular group. I was shocked. I was shown a flood that was going to hit my country of birth. Well, I got some cussing off publicly from an AOG guy acting like he's a superintendent of all things. Put a good cussing on me. And uh, I had not told anybody about that, that vision because it was not like a one-time vision. It kept coming again, again, and again. The only person who knew that I was seeing this thing was my wife. I'd wake her up and said, well, uh, turn on your phone and see what's happening down in the country there. See if there's a flood happening there. She said, no, what's up with you? But I was seeing it night after night after night for, for two days shy, three weeks, 19 days in a row. Something has got to be happening for you to see it 19 times. Anyway, 
So I was out in an all-night prayer meeting that night, and the Lord said, tell this group what you saw. So I told them. The first thing they asked, are you sure it's the Lord? <clears throat> the, the, the second thing, the, the, the questions were very skeptical, almost like they were spitting in my face. They're like, why would the Lord show you this? You're not even living in the country. What does that have to do with anything? And then the, the questioning continued. It was just a downright spiral. When I left that place that night, I put my hands on my ears and I said, Lord, I will never tell that group anything else after that night. Ever. They're not ready for anything. Why did you want me to tell that group? I, don't, I haven't gotten the answer yet. But those people were skeptical to the bone. Why does God give you things and then you know you, he knows you're going to get your name scandalized and vandalized by people who walk in ignorance of the scripture the guy said there's no flood coming because since no time god said he's not going to drown the world he's going to uh he's going to send fire so esibom has lost his mind he's the falsest of all false prophets well your country being flooded is not the world I, I got i was so amazed at the level of ignorance that he was demonstrating he doesn't know a universal flood from a national flood so there's no way i could answer him because the guy was not where do you start to explore and to to teach that level of imbecility you, you just can't start this is a kindergarten child here you trying to tell them quantum physics they would not understand i just threw a, a salvo right there i know i'm going to hear back from whoever there will arise false apostles. There will arise immature, genuine apostles. Now notice in this case, they are genuine, but they are immature. They haven't grown in the thing yet. They are called to be, and they know they are called to be, to start throw their ways around. Look, when you are called to be, do not throw your ways around. Grow into the thing. Don't go around with a big briefcase and telling everybody, y'all submit to me because apostles are first. <laughs> You're the first ignoramus we have seen as an apostle and we don't have time for you. God have mercy on your soul. You were doing so well before you got this title. Now you got the big head. You're so pompous. We know the Lord didn't give you anything. Grow into the call. Take your time. Grow, grow, grow. Let your apostolicity swell. Can you grow? Yes, you can grow. Doesn't the Bible say grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord? Now notice you're growing graciously, you're growing. You're not growing roughly, walking all over people. The fact that you're an apostle does not give you the right to try to be boss over God's people. Because somebody is going to tell you your eyes black and then you're going to lose all of the, all the air in your little balloon. All right. So they will rise false apostles. I'm balancing this teaching now. They will arise immature ap apostles. They will arise wrongly motivated apostles. They are apostles and they are mature, but their motivation is about the money. The motivation is about the strutting. The motivation is about the lording it over God's heritage. Huh? They will arise pseudo apostles who will bring reproach and make an improper, unbalanced presentation. The way they present their apostolicity is immature, it's unbalanced, and it's improper. Can preachers be improper? Oh, yes. Unbalanced? Yes. You've got to realize that you're talking to God's people. <clears throat> and you're not going to scream at me and, and get off, because I can scream back. When you get invited to a church... That's not your church. Act graciously. Preach the word. Preach the truth. But don't try to be the boss of those people. You are not their pastor. You are not their leader. Stop. You're going overboard and out of hand with your nonsense. <clears throat> there will be those in the apostolic movement when it comes. That will take things to extremes. They will take things to extremes. They'll be too far out over here or too far out over there. Number one, see all of that is number one, yeah. They will make the apostles something that they were never intended to be. They are the greatest among the church. Apostles are the greatest 
That's what the Bible called them first. No. No. Jesus said, let the greatest among you be the servant. What does he mean? Let them serve up their gift. So your greatness, sir, your largest, madam, does not give you the right to be an overbearing person walking around demanding that everybody brings you avian water at six degrees and all that kind of junk that so many people who last night were made apostles realize that they can strut. They make apostles something they were never intended to be. That word first as it relates to the apostle, it is only because they are the pioneers. They are going to plant and to start that thing against the gates of hell and to plant a church there. That's why they are first. But first doesn't mean that they are the one and only important ministry and everybody ought to bow down to them. That is not what it means. But that is what a lot of apostles think it means. They go around calling people son, calling people my daughter in Christ, my spiritual daughter, and then demanding from these <clears throat> overnight spiritual sons and daughters that they must give them 10% of what comes into the church, send it to their ministry. That's abuse. You're not no father of that person. You just came. And some people just like to grabble people's children who are well trained and try to be father over them. I've seen people over the years snatch members of my church all over the place and try to make, make them their spiritual children. Well, where were you when they were drunk? Where were you? I didn't see you then. I was the one that God used to get them to the stage where they're at. And now that you see that they are poised and polished and well-behaved and have some modicum of scriptural knowledge, you want to make them your little, uh, your little mini-me. Where are the people you raised up with your raggedy apostolicity? Where are they? I see it all the time. I have to laugh. Like, where did you know this person from? Just last week, I called a person and said, uh, where did you know this guy from? And they said, he just adopted me. <laughs> and I said, just like that? They said, yes. And, and then they said to me, they said, you know, I just have to laugh. I said, I'm not laughing. And they knew what I meant by I'm not laughing because I was the one who was there. I'm just telling you what I went through. And I'm still going through with people who would come to the church, identify some nice brother or sister in there. And then they want to adopt them as their spiritual child and want to call themselves the father of this. So what does that make me? There are no grandfathers in this kingdom. They're fathers and they're, that's it. If you're the father, then I'm not. What do I become then, grandfather? <laughs> My grandchild name is, I love Karina. Uh, 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 uh. She's my girl. Oh, I love Karina. Karina, Karina. Karina, Karina. Every time she comes and, and I see her, I burst out with that song. And when I say, I love Karina, she says, ah, 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 ah. She takes off running and laughing. That's my one grandchild. There's no grandchildren in this kingdom. And you pastors with your raggedy members, stop calling other people's children your own. Get your own. Don't put your stamp on them because they're well-behaved and well-trained. Calling them your spiritual daughter. They are not. And in case you didn't know, I'm telling you now. They are not your child. They are not your spiritual daughter. They are not your spiritual son. They didn't get born again with you. You didn't impart anything to them. You didn't train them. You didn't make any investment in them. But now that they are mature in Christ and ready to run through a troop and leap over a wall, now that you see graces and gifts in them, you want to put your little stamp on them and strut around the place as though you're some big producer of good people. <laughs> some people don't see any gifts in others until you see it and the minute you see it they start to see it but now they want to put their little wings over it and cover it and run with it now it's not going to work like that <laughs> i'm watching you god is watching us yeah, let them groom their own, these shysters. They are not yours. Hands off. Loose. You foul apostle, you. Hmm. A lot of problems are happening because we are making apostles something that God never intended for them to be. And that has got to be avoided. We've got to avoid making them something that they are not intended to be. They cannot 
give you apostolicity, give you prophetic gift. They can't do that. That's God's portfolio. Secondly, they cannot boss you around and lord it over you and pretend as though everything they say you must do. Thirdly, they cannot come to your church and exercise authority and jurisdiction over you. Fourthly, they cannot call you spiritual son, spiritual daughter, and demand that you send them 10% of everything that you earn. That devil is a liar, and so is his father-in-law and all of his adopted children. <laughs> here we go, here we go. Mm. One of the things that needs to be balanced in the, in the apostolic ministry is the misapplication, the misapplied first mention principle. First mention principle. In Ephesians 4 and 11, Paul talks about the first mention being the greatest in authority. Firstly, apostle. But in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 and 28, Paul, who wrote the letter to Ephesus, states that God has set in the church apostles, secondarily prophets, and thirdly, teachers. But in the other case, when he wrote to Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus, he said apostles, prophets, pastors, then teachers. So you know the scripture cannot be broken. And Paul couldn't say the pastor is third. And then in another case, he says uh, the teacher is third. Is he confused? No, he's not. That needs some explanation. I've got the explanation, but I'm not giving the explanation tonight. But the point I'm making here is, the first mention principle has been misapplied by apostles who have big egos. In one of the scriptures, Paul is simply giving a sampling of the fivefold ministry, and in the order he is listing in one place all the fivefold ministries of Christ. He's listing them in order in one place. And in the other case, he's just mentioning them. But he doesn't mean that this is the order in which they come. Are you feeling me now? So you've got to know that. You've got to know that, or else you'll get yourself in all kinds of trouble because you don't know the subject hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science of proper biblical interpretation. Hermeneutics. Write that word down. Hermeneutics. We have to do that in Bible school. Hermeneutics, how to rightly divide the scripture. Hermeneutics, hermeneutics, hermeneutics. That's why you'll hear me say we need text and context because if we don't get text and context, we will end up with pretext. A lot of what is happening in the church is pretext because they ignore the text or they took it out of its context. Now they got pretext and they're running with pretext. A lot of sermons are based on pretext. They just read a line and preach that line. And it doesn't mean what that line, what they say the line, what that, that thing, it doesn't mean what they think it means. But you can't go around correcting everybody. I used to be correcting people on Facebook with all kinds of stuff. Now I, I, I got to really like you. I got to love you. And I got to know you. And we got to be buddy friends. And I got to know that you're not going to take this the wrong way. All kinds of stuff. I'm not correcting anymore. I'm done with that. Because for one thing, you don't get paid to correct people. For the second thing, you get enemies. They're, oh, you think you are, you are the CEO of the universe. The Lord has sent you to correct everything. And, and like you don't make mistakes. Or some people block you. Now you lose a good friend. <laughs> oh, Lord, our help in ages past. Our hope for years to come. Our shelters from the stormy blast. And our eternal home. If the apostle is the greatest. Huh? If the apostle is the greatest. What does a pastor do. If he has several people in his church. Who are called to be the apostle. But he's the pastor over the apostle. Must every apostle leave the church. And have his own ministry to fulfill his calling. Can you not be an apostle and a member of a church. Are you saying that all apostles have to come out of the church and go start churches and stay away from pastors? That is not what I'm saying, but that is what some people feel. I'm an apostle, but I'm a member of this church, and he's a pastor. How can a pastor lead an apostle when an apostle is first? First means you, you're superior to them, so you can't serve under this pastor because the, the greater is being bossed by the, by, by the lesser. 
<laughs> and they get mad and leave that church. Hey, Joker, go back. Go back under that pastor and serve him faithfully because it is only when you have faithfully done the job that belongs to another man that God will give you your own. Let me say that again. It is only when you have faithfully served in another man's job, in another man's work, in another man's house, in another man's ministry, that God will give you your own. Some people will stay with you, but you know they are just waiting to jump off and go their own way. And while they are there, they will be undermining you all the time. So they are not serving faithfully. And then they leave and you breathe a sigh of relief. You're glad they are gone. But guess what? It won't be long before somebody just like themselves, an undermining, lying snake, will join their ministry and multiply that undermining that they were doing when they were at your church. You reap what you sow. You were not faithful in that which belonged to another man. I've had people work with me, and while they're working with me, they're trying to get their marriage license, they're trying to get their minister credential, and, uh, they, but they don't want me to know. But of course, sometimes the people call and say, Rev, you got, this guy is a member of your church. I said, yes. He's trying to get a marriage certificate here to, you know, to become a marriage officer. But he doesn't want you to know. What's that about? I don't know. Do you recommend him? Yes, highly. But he, why does he want to hide from you? I don't know. Maybe he wants to surprise me and bring it to the... But I know he's just trying to sneak off and try to carry some members when he's going. This kind of a betrayal that takes place in the church, what people don't know... They are sowing betrayal into their ministry. And the ministry, when they get it, will be filled with betrayal. Filled with betrayal. Why? You sowed that. You're going to get what you sow. You're going to reap what you sow. Serve faithfully if you're going to serve in a ministry. If you want to go, go now. Don't wait around and try to stop people in the back. Don't stay there with the hope of gathering some. What people do, they stay in a the church. They watch for the faithful people. And they befriend them with the hope that when they leave, they're going to pull these faithful people with them. So they want faithful people, but they themselves are a snake. A snake cannot produce faithful people. Even if those people go with them, those people will turn into snakes. Why? Snakes can only produce snakes. You show them how to be a snake. So now they are a snake with you. And they're going to bite you. Miss Lady, where ask her bite me? Righty, righty, righty. <laughs> You see how I can laugh? Look, the amount of betrayal and backstabbing and duplicity and sneaky behavior that I've seen over the years, it should have drove, drove me mad. But I'm as sane as they come and I'm laughing all the way to heaven. Glory to God. And sometimes I warn these people, I tell them, say, come, 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 come. Have a seat in my office, of course. Let me tell you something what's going to happen to your ministry when you have it. You're going to have a ministry. It's going to be full of snakes. You know why? No, Rev, tell me. Because you are a snake. You're a snake. You're here with me, but you're pretending to be with me. And all the time you're undermining what I'm doing here. You always have snide remarks to make. You're cutting the ground. You're trying to proceed with ministry and doing it in a clandestine way, hiding and dodging to get credentials all over the place. And the people still have to call back to the church that you're from to find out what manner of man is this. And I always give them good words about you. When you went to get that thing, I was the one that told them to go ahead with it. I give the green light to that thing. Rev, you know about that? Yes, I know about that. I know you got your marriage license. Rev, you know? Yes. But you never said anything. It's not my job. To, I'm telling you now. You're a snake. And when you get your ministry, the first sign that you're a snake will be you will produce snakes quick. <laughs> You'll produce people like you. Undermining, devious, scheming, lying snakes. Just like yourself. And I'm, I'm telling them this, hoping that they would say... My Rev, man, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I thought you would try to block me. And, you know, let's, let's make peace. And just repent and just shake hands and forget about that. Go on with yourself. Life is too short to be doing these kinds of things with big people. But rarely you'll find them 
admit their fault and make peace, they prefer to lie. Say, Rev, that never happened. I never told them that. And you see the guilt on their face. Come on, man. Don't make it worse. You're already a snake. Now you want to be an alligator too? Just admit that you lied and you, you, you schemed and let's get off and repent and let the blood of Jesus. Rev, I never, I never told them not to tell you. I never. <laughs> hey. All those of you who are serving in churches and you're unfaithful, when you have your church, your people will be unfaithful. All those of you who are serving in churches and you're stealing and robbing God, when you get your church, you will produce some of the meanest mothers that are on the planet. They will come to your church. They will not support your ministry. All those of you who are undermining the pastor and waiting for your chance to get out of there, when you have members, you'll have members just like you who are waiting for their chance to get out of there. They will ride your coattail until it's time to leave the bus. And when they leave, they'll try to take some of your best people because you sowed that, stole be the best people from the church you came from, and you're going to reap what you sow. It's an unalterable principle. It happens to churches too. You cannot steal members from somebody else and be an undermining snake and then go and produce godly people when you're in ministry. I don't care how you can plan. I don't care how you can strategize. I don't care how good you are. If you're a snake, you will produce snakes. I wanted to add a thus said the Lord, but that's just done already. You don't even need a thus said the Lord to concretize that. You reap what you sow. Kabo Saka in there. If you're serving at a local church, <coughs> excuse me. If you're serving at a local church, all those people who go to a church and you never see them, they're always absent when they get their church. They'll have lots of absenteeism happening. Then they will see the importance of going to church. All those of you who go to church, you never have a kind word to say about that pastor when you get your church. Nobody will have a kind word to say to you about you. Because you were a brute. You were brutish and brutal. You were asinine when you went to that church. You behaved like an absolute gorilla. You had no earthly compassion and love for that pastor. And you expect to, to have loving, kind, gentle people in your congregation. Ain't going to happen. You're going to produce gorillas like yourself. You're going to produce chihuahuas and chimpanzees like yourself. Because that's what you were when you attended that local church. You were a trouble in paradise. And you will get trouble in your paradise. Because you sowed it. And you will reap what you sow. Alright. I'm balancing some stuff here. <laughs> what you sorry about, Sister G. There's an old, 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 old style, old head, old school process of thinking that says only apostles can minister to apostles. No pastor is supposed to minister to an apostle. No prophet is supposed to minister to an apostle. No teacher, because the apostle is highest in rank and he's first and as first, no, he must come first. He's the one to minister to them and they're not the ones to minister to him. <laughs> hey, 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 come, 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 come. Even as an apostle with the gift of revelation, there are times when you need to be taught certain things. That's why you got a teacher there. So he can teach you. You're gifted, but this is his area of expertise. Yeah? That's why I get annoyed with politicians. Look how many of them are pretending to be doctors now. Telling you to, to, to what to do, when to do, how to do. And diagnosing stuff and, and giving out prescriptions and stuff like that. Hey, the fact that you're a politician does not make you a doctor. Leave the medical thing to the doctors. How the medical profession can sit back and allow this extraordinary level of what's happening now is beyond me. And the media is in bed dispensing medicine like they were doctors themselves. Watch y'all self here. Boost your immune system so that your body can fight off anything and everything. The doctrine that says only apostles can minister to apostles is erroneous. It's a lie. It's a satanic fabrication. It's dangerous to the body of Christ because it neglects and negates the importance of the other ministry. The prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. They feel, the old school teaching feels that it is not proper for a lower rank ministry 
to counsel, prophesy, or teach the apostle. Okay, so if nobody can minister to the apostle, that makes the apostle a law unto himself. And now he's a higher rank and he's in the elite society in the body of Christ. He's a Brahmin in the body of Christ. We don't have elite and uh, low, low caste in the body of Christ. We don't have that in the body of Christ. There are no elite people. The apostle is not elite of a special order that nobody can talk to them. Well, if you are so separated from the other members of the body of Christ, why are you in the body? Why are you in the body? Doesn't the Bible teach that every joint supplied? It does. Every joint supplies. So the apostle A needs to supply to the body and the apostle B needs to be supplied with. With what? With what the other gifts bring. Every joint is supplying to another joint. Everybody brings something to the table when they come. Paul said, when you assemble together, let everyone have a psalm, a hymn, a tongue, an interpretation. He said, let everything be done decently and in order. So every joint, meaning every member of the body, when they come to church, they should come with something that can benefit the body. You're not coming to church to get blessed. You're coming to church to bring your gift and to impart your gift so that you can be a blessing. Aware with this petty, childish thing, I come here today and I hope we have a nice time and I hope I get blessed. You are not there to get blessed. You are there to be a blessing. Get off this childish behavior. You come into church to be entertained and to get blessed. You are there to be a blessing. That's why you come to that service. Everything else is icing on the cake. You are there to be a blessing. You are there to impart. You are there to give some of what you have. You can't give what you don't have. And you don't have anything because you don't come to church with anything because the expectation is that the pastor will come and preach you happy and preach you amen and lay hands and bless and you leave there high as a kite and because you're a do-nothing Christian, you're a little Christianette listening to sermonette and you're still smoking cigarette. You need deliverance from that idea that you always must be entertained and you're here to get blessed. That's why you come to church. That's false doctrine. That's apostasy to believe you're going to church to get a blessing. I'm so tired of these petty little children. Every time they come, you got to have a prophetic line. 200 people. After you have preached, your socks wet, your shorts wet, your vest wet, your, your suit wet, and 200 people still want prayer. Well, what was I doing when I was preaching? Eh? What was I doing there? Wasting time? You ought to know how to receive that imparted word which is able to save. And not have the preacher work double shift by preaching like a like a whatever and then having to pray for 200 people pray for yourself you lazy rascal <laughs> how can you call people lazy rascal because that's what it is some church going people are parasites they just come there to be fed and to be pedicured and manicured and have the their hair done and have their eyelids plucked and have their lips done and have their rouge and their, and their mascara and their fake eyelash and their false hair. They just come to be pedicured and manicured and facial and all the other stuff. These do-nothing people are a drain on the church. They bring nothing when they come except a fat, lazy body that they sit there soaking and sour. They rarely receive the impartation because you know they are parasitic. Because after all that preaching, they are unable to soak up what they heard. They still need you to lay hands on them after the service is done. They still need special prayer. Stop that childish behavior. Oh, this is called apostolic order. It means I'm setting order in what? In whoever house needs order. I went to a church recently and after the service was done, the people lined up and the pastor praying for them. I asked the pastor, how do you do it? How can you preach like Peter, prophesy like Paul, and then when you're exhausted, you still have to pray over all these people. You're killing yourself. You need to stop. You need to stop. And they're trying the same thing with me. I said, no, no. When I'm finished preaching, I'm going home. On the third night, I'll pray for a few people. On the last night, I may pray for everybody, but I may not. But I will not pray for everybody after I finish preaching every night. Because when I preach... I give it everything I've got. And when I'm done, you can wring my shirt. You can wring my vest. You can wring my socks, my shorts. 
perspiration, you can wring it. Water will pour out of it. I lose two pounds after every service. I gain it back again, but two pounds, minimum one pound every time I preach. It's exhausting. And one sermon is equivalent to two days of hard labor. You can't continue like that. Preaching all of that stuff and then praying for all of these people. Stop doing it. Yeah, stop doing it. Train them to pray for themselves. Train them to pray for each other. Train them to hear from God while the message is going on and to receive something from the sermon that you don't have to lay hands and pray and prophesy on them after this. There's no such thing as special prayer. As long as you have done the job of ministering that word, you do not need to give anybody any special prayer unless you are led by the Spirit, not them asking you. Because they will wear you out and kill you. And when you're dead, they'll go to your funeral and say, what a nice pastor we had. And they'll look for another joker like you to kill again. Stop doing it. And some of you pastors, you're so childish. You love the attention. Oh, they just need a little prayer. Let me pray for this one. Let me pray for that one. You feel the need to be needed. And you're so needy that if they don't ask you for prayer, you're not happy to go home with your raggedy self. They have to ask you for prayer for you to feel like you're worth something. Stop that with your childish behavior. You love when they come to run to you for prayer because it feeds your need to be, to be needed. You're full of need. Get over yourself and your need to be needed. Get over yourself. Tomorrow you drop there, they'll find another joker like you. And pray them to death too. Look, what I'm saying here now, I'm saying from experience, I've buried a lot of preacher friends who would pray for five, six hundred, two thousand, three thousand people. Day after day, week after week, year after year. And all of them are dead now. Powerful ministries, great miracles, but they're dead. They could have lived another 20 years and be much more effective and productive for the kingdom of God, but they needed to be needed. And they died exhorting themselves because they just had the need to be needed. You got a wife, you got some children, go play with them. Go dance crazy with your grandchildren. Go act a fool. Roll on the floor with them. Laugh like there's no tomorrow. Dance out of tune with them. You're no bishop then. You're no apostle then. They don't care. They sit on your face and poop on you. They don't care you're an apostle. <laughs> Have some fun with your life. Stop being this deep. Everything for you is prayer and fasting and casting out demons. If the door, car, the car door is stuck, Satan, I bind you. It's not Satan. You need some WD-40 <laughs> with your crazy self. And sometimes you need a mechanic. Come on, y'all. We got to stop being children with this thing. Oh, glory to God. Some people feel that if they attend a church, it is an atrocity for a pastor to be pastoring a church when there is an apostle in that place and the apostle is submitting to the pastor. That's a travesty of justice. No apostle should submit to any pastor. There are times when I need to hear a good word. And I got a few preachers that I listen to. I pay attention to what they say. Sometimes I need a good teaching. I find a good teacher and I sit myself down and listen to every word they say and I soak it up. Sometimes I need to see people get saved. I find a good evangelist and I watch their stuff and I say, yes, yes, they're still out there. They're still fighting. You don't have it all. I don't have it all. I listen to people all the time. All the time. There's not a day that go by I don't listen to somebody else because they have a different way of seeing things, different perspective. Stop trying to be the omnicompetent pastor. That's why you die early. There are some pastors there in charge of the ladies' ministry. And when the ladies meet, there's the pastor sitting there, the man. He wouldn't let them ladies talk their business. He's all up in the meeting. Hey, Rev, go home. Go home now. Yeah, leave, leave. No, don't wait for keys. Go home. Your wife will bring the keys later. You're in charge of a ladies' ministry. You need deliverance. Your self-important little self. He's in charge of ladies' ministry. He's in charge of youth ministry. He's in charge of evangelism. He's just... <laughs> no wonder you look so old and ragged. 
Go home, Rev. They don't need you in that ladies' ministry. You're a man. Go home. Yeah, go now. Go. Yeah, go now. Yeah, shut the church door and go. <laughs> the world will not fall in, kitchen little. Let me read a scripture here from Matthew 20, 25 to 28. But Jesus called them to himself and said unto them, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. The rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. That's not supposed to be a pastor or an apostle or a prophet lording it over God's people. That's the Gentiles. That's how sinners behave. They get a position and they, they drive the people to powder. I have seen a lot of uh, superintendents or overseers. They get that position and I've heard them. More than three of them said, this overseer position carries enormous powers. I have enormous powers. And the way they say the powers, we have enormous powers in this office. Enormous power. And you can see the delight in their eye. It's almost a demonic glint. And you know this joker is going to find himself in a whole lot of trouble. And all of them have found themselves in a whole lot of trouble. When they started off saying, this office has enormous power. Power and authority is given so that you can serve the people better. Not lord it over them and boss them around. I can't stand bossy people. The minute somebody is overbearing and bossy, something in me starts to rile up. Like, I want to tell them where to get off, but it's not my boss. I paid to get a ticket, so I can't tell them to get off. <laughs> but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, Those, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, and those, yet it shall not be so among you. What? It shall not be so among you. Among who? You. You, the church, it shall not be so among you. In other words, you're not to lord it over them, and you're not to exercise great authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Stop being a boss and a bully. But whosoever desires to be great among you, all you apostles who want to be the greatest, and the chiefest, and first, listen to what Jesus said, let him be your servant. What does he mean? Let him serve his gift to the body. Let him serve his gift. Let him serve up his gift. And whosoever desires to be first among you, you apostles that desire to be first, let him be your slave, your servant, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served. And these preachers, they just love to be served. Somebody to carry the briefcase. Somebody to open the door. Somebody to come on Saturday and wash their car. And you young men and young women, y'all need to stop this nonsense of going about uh, washing the pastor's shorts and cleaning his socks and washing his home and cooking his meals and washing his car and running errands for him. God did not call anybody to be an errand boy. And I'm talking about abusive pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, yeah, yeah, re, re. There is more abuse in leadership in church than there is balance I can want to wash your car or not you're not going to make me wash your car I can wash my own car and some of you ladies that like to wash preachers clothes y'all need to stop it yes yeah, stop it there's laundry for that S-T-O-P-I-T -T. there's a laundry for that here you got a man's cheesy shorts and you preachers aren't you ashamed to have some man's wife washing your cheesy shorts and your cheesy socks. Don't you have any sense of pride? Your shorts, man, come on. You need deliverance if you're that lazy. A woman washing your shorts. I was on a, one of the islands a few years ago. And this woman came. Uh, Reverend, where's your laundry? <laughs> I laughed. I said, call your pastor and talk to him. She called the pastor and she came back. She said, Rev, I'm, I'm sorry. I said, okay, that's all right. <laughs> the pastor forgot to tell them, don't ask him for his clothes. He washes his own clothes. He does his own ironing and that stuff. Don't start no fight with that preacher. He's not one like the other guy. He, he does his own laundry. And, and they were, when I was leaving, say, you know, you know, Rev, you're strange. They say, yes, I'm strange. You mean you do your own laundry? Yes. Nobody is seeing my shorts. I'm home and I wash my own shorts home. Oh yes. Do my own laundry. 
My wife is not a, a, a washing machine. What? Rev, you do your own laundry? Yes, I do my own laundry. That doesn't make me less a, a mighty man of God. <laughs> Look at you all say, oh my goodness. I never heard it in this fashion. You all need to hear it. And whosoever desires to be first among you, that's the apostles now that love to be first among you, let him be your servant. This is Matthew 25, 25 to 28. This is Jesus talking. You need to show these apostles and prophets these scriptures. When they want to be a boss over you and, and, and a lord over you and bring their cheesy socks and shorts for you to wash, say, Rev, I'm going to wash your shirt and your jacket and pants. Get your dirty shorts out to this laundry in the name of Jesus. And them socks, take them too. I don't do that. I don't roll like that. Don't get a sister upset up in here, up in here. Not even my husband's shorts I don't watch, far less yours, Bishop. Take it out now before I go buck wild on you to the glory of God. <laughs> Power of the living God be against all this laziness in this kingdom. And whosoever desires to be first among you, you apostles, let him be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 9 and 35. If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all, A, and servant of all, B. Last of all, the least in importance, and servant of all. All means all. He's serving male, female, children, everybody. I don't hear the apostles quoting this scripture. You have to have the Bible rightly divided. That's why we're talking about balance here. Arrangements should be made for visiting preachers in regard to their laundry. And among the things that should not happen, their shorts and socks should not be washed by anybody in that nation. They ought to be told to wash that themselves, take it to the laundry themselves, make arrangements to have them, the, the, the person with the clothes, take their laundry to the laundryman. As long as socks and shorts are involved, the preacher should take his own laundry to the laundryman. Are you feeling a brother now? I can see some preachers squirming in their chair with their lazy cells, sitting watching TV, and have some man's wife washing their cheesy shorts. I don't, I can't get that in a million years. How a man could have another man's wife washing his shorts and his socks. You have to be extraordinarily lazy to want that. And to be comfortable doing that. I know some of you will get back to me. But let me warn you. If you throw one. I will throw two. <laughs> Jesus forever settles the question of who is the greatest. He says the least shall be the greatest. The greatest is not the one who is highest in the title and position and authority. With thousands of people serving him. The greatest in the church is the one who is the most humble. Who serves the most people and does not concern himself or herself with thoughts of whether he or she is greatest or highest in position. All of the people who love to strut are not genuine apostles and prophets. Some of them are but they haven't been taught. And unless they are taught, it makes them not genuine because they are not balanced in their perception of what the scripture is teaching. And they don't ever quote Jesus. They quote Paul to the Corinthian church. That says the apostles are first, but they don't quote Jesus in Matthew, who says, let the first be last and be the servant of all. You've got to put the two scriptures together and then come up with a balanced, balanced position. And they don't come heavier than Jesus. They don't come weightier than Jesus. Listen to Jesus and follow his example. The disciples did not wash his feet. He took a towel. And wash the disciples' feet. Come on now. Come on now. For I think that God has displayed us, Paul to the Corinthians. I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last. God has displayed the apostles how? Last. As men condemned to death. 
for we, the apostles, have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We, the apostles, are fools for Christ's sake. We are treated as ignoramuses. But you are wise. Everybody else is wise. Only the apostles are fools. You are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. And being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world. What? The apostles have been made the filth of the world. What do you do with filth? You get rid of it. You throw it out. It's under your feet. You don't even want to match that mess. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. He's talking to a church that he started, and they are treating him like a fool. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. Because some teachers had come along and they were trying to be the spiritual father of Paul's children. And they were isolating Paul. They were dropping little remarks to cut Paul out from the hearts of the people. Some people cannot stand tall unless they're standing on somebody's head. They got to mash you down to look tall. God help the arrogance of some preachers. He said you can have 10,000 instructors but not many fathers and at the end of the day you Corinthian people, I am your daddy. Paul is my daddy, oh. <laughs> he is my daddy, oh. He is my daddy, oh. St. Paul is my daddy, oh. It's not a Paul, oh, so. <laughs> For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4. 19. Those who desire the name and calling apostle because they have this grandiose idea of power, respect, and prestige, they need to take a closer look at these scriptures. Apostles that will be raised up in this last day apostolic movement must be of the order of Paul and behave like that. Like the last, like the least, like the servant, like the offscoring, like the scum of the earth, like the humble man that starts a church and allows others to come and do their ministry even when those others are trying to cut him out and kick him to the curb. They will always be in the church, ambitious people who desire to take the title of apostle. They will always be in the church, ambitious people, Saka, who desire to take the title of apostle. And when we see apostles rise in these last days of time, a lot of them will not be apostles but they will be ambitious men desiring to take the title. And you can tell by their spirit, by their fruit, by their facial expression, by the way they talk, by the way they carry themselves, by the way they boss people around, by the way they strut on the pulpit as if it belongs to them, by the lack of reverence, by the lack of decorum on the pulpit, by the lack of etiquette, by the lazy behavior of trying to be Lord and trying to make a mini-me out of the people. By demanding cars to take them where they want to go and demanding that the, the people must buy this and that for them and buy that and that for them. And that's not even talking about the honorarium. Demanding that they get uh, 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 $10,000 a night and da 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 Some people just have to leave them where they're at. The demands that they make. Some preachers are overbearing and very demanding. And usually those men have no signs and wonders following them. All that follows them are the bills that they ran up when they were at the hotel. Eating the most expensive breakfast, lunch, dinner every day. They have to run up a $500 a day bill at the hotel. And when they leave, the church has to come together and have a board meeting and pawn all their jewelry to get money to pay, to pay the bill for this so-called apostle. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Paul never bragged or boasted about his apostolic ministry. He never boasted. All he wanted to do was to know Christ in the fellowship of his suffering 
and in the power of his resurrection. He said, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not even worth calling an apostle because I persecuted the church. And yet, look all the mighty deeds. The man wrote most of the New Testament. And he was walking small in his own eyes. And these other guys, have you seen any teaching by Apollos anywhere in the scripture? Is there any book by Apollos? He was that bright. He was that smart. He was that anointed. He was that incredible a speaker. There are no books of Apollos. But there are 17 from Paul. And Christians lack the discernment to know Shibboleth. They'll be in love and enamored with Apollos and they'll ignore Paul. The man who's doing the work is ignored. And these new found, new fangled Johnny come lately. They'll follow that Johnny come lately and throw away the old shoe that fits so nice. Christianity of our day is quick and ready to discard the people that have labored the most among them. They count you as dumb and they exalt these false prophets, these shysters, and these ambitious people that love to take titles, love to demand more and more money. You know, my salary needs to be increased, you know. My salary needs to be increased, you know. My salary needs to be increased, you know. I've been preaching for 42 years. Not once have I gone to the church and said, my salary needs to be increased, you know. Never. And it's not going to happen. My salary needs to be increased. Your anointing needs to be increased. Your prayer life needs to be increased. Your humility needs to be increased. Your work ethic, that needs to be increased. Your punctuality, increase that. Your regularity, increase that. Less ragged sermons, increase that. <laughs> You see, I can laugh and say these things because I'm called as an apostle to correct error in the church. So a lot of times you'll hear me correcting error. What am I doing there? I'm doing my job. I'm doing my calling. I get great joy doing it. I know I'm not going to be well liked for doing it, but I'm not here to win friends and influence people in terms of making them my little disciple because they're going to like me. But some people still like it. They say, you, you know, Rev, tell me the truth. Don't lie to me. Tell me the truth. I'm not going to come to your church, but tell me the truth. <laughs> Some of these jokers, they have to be on their dying bed for them to send for me. And they always send for me when they're dying. Reverend Essiboom, I've always respected your ministry. I said, you're a dying man. Stop lying. You never came to my church once and you live five minutes off the street. If you had had any respect for my ministry, at least you would have come once. Or you would have sent a special offering at one time. I never saw your name on any of the offerings. You never send me a dime, but you respect my ministry. Let's not lie. You're about to die. Let's make this thing pleasant as possible. That's why I like you. I know you will tell me the truth. I didn't come. I said, don't give me no excuse why. I know why you didn't come. You did not appreciate the ministry. You did not like to hear the truth. You wanted people to tickle your ears and tell you what you like to hear. That's why you're going to that church of the street. So let's get that off the table right now. All right, all right, all right, Rev. Are you sure about your salvation? Well, that's why I wanted you to come, Rev. Let's talk about that. And every last one of them went off and died in peace, smiling. See you over there, Rev. Take care of my children. We gather the children together. You almost listen to this pastor. I didn't do it because I didn't like him. I didn't like the way he blunt and tell, you know, he doesn't mince his words. I didn't like preachers like that. I like them to make me happy and smile, but I'm dying. I don't have time for semantics and all these games you almost listen to this preacher they got to be dying to appreciate what they did not appreciate while they were living don't wait until you're dying to call a brother call me now <laughs> well no no I, I don't mean that i don't mean you got to call me now i don't want my phone to ring i like my peace in any event when i'm done here my son is going out to to his basketball practice and his gym and i'm the i'll, I'll be driving miss miss daisy I'll be driving him to that place. So when I'm done here, I've got some way to go. So don't call. Don't call tomorrow either. I'll be preparing. Don't call uh, Saturday. Don't call Sunday. Don't call. <laughs> Continue your life as you're doing it. You can send a message, you know, I'll make a little comment somewhere, but don't call. Hallelujah. Our brother just love his privacy to be with Jesus. The only time Paul boasted about his apostolic ministry and life experience was when those superficial apostles were promoting themselves as the greatest and Paul being a nothing. 
Yes, don't call. <laughs> they were exercising dominion over the saints in a high-handed way, in a high-handed, condescending, demeaning manner. And Paul felt it necessary. Paul felt it necessary to counteract what was going on. And so he, he let them know, I consider, 2 Corinthians 11 and 5, that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostle. I consider, says Paul, 2 Corinthians 11 and 5, that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostle. You bring the most eminent apostle that's on the land right now, and I'm not inferior to any one of them. That's what Paul said. Now, whoa! Didn't he say he's least among the apostles? Well, he's shutting his stuff now. He's letting them know that with all he's walking in humility, he knows who he is. And he knows he carries a weight of glory. But he was just being a nice guy. And a lot of Christians don't appreciate nice guys. They like these rough, rude, crude preachers that boss them around. He describes how the Corinthian Christians were being so enthusiastic about these super apostles that just came the other day. And they were willingly putting up with their carnal ways. They were acquiescing to every demand by these rascal so-called prophet apostles. And while at the same time they were scorning Paul's humble and unselfish apostolic ministry. I don't know what it is about the church, but when you're humble and unselfish... People seem to think that they have the right to kick you in the face, pluck out your eye, pull out your teeth, hang your tongue down and cut off half of it. And you should take it gracefully and say, thank you, sister. Do you want a piece more of my tongue to cut out? And they have the nerve to be mad when you don't acquiesce to those ridiculous demands. Most Christians that I know, they love an abusive minister. When you're too nice, they get all nasty on you. And when ministers are nasty, they get all nice on them. I can't figure that one out. I know some kind, generous, loving, compassionate pastors, and those people will not treat them right. And I know some absolute rascals. I mean, rascals of the highest order, immoral to the bone. And these brethren would cook for them every day, bring the food, give them gifts every three months. Send them on a vacation every year. Give them 10,000 spending money to spend when they go on vacation. And they pay for that hotel. They pay that ticket. They pay the hotel. They give them 10,000 spending money every year. They treat them like absolute royalty. And these men are as wicked. And then in that same congregation, they have some genuine God-fearing, God-loving. And they treat that person like absolute crap. You know, sometime back in the past, I can't recall what day it was, but I said to myself, I'm going to be a nice guy, but not so nice. No more Mr. Nice Guy. But I'm still nice, but I'm not as nice as I used to be. I had to draw the line somewhere. And people now, they find me to be nice, but you ask my adversaries, I am as combative, as tough, as no nonsense as they come. And I will not put up with nonsense from high-ranking officials of the church and low-ranking officials of the church. Things that I used to let slide, I don't let slide anymore. I will call your bluff. I will tell you your eyes are black. I don't care what position you hold in the church. I will tell you, sir, you're out of order. You're out of line. You're unscriptural, unbiblical, and immoral. I'm not talking about a weakness. Now you got this weakness and every now and then. I'm talking about deliberate, malicious, living that way for donkey years with no intentions of changing, getting worse and worse, and more and more demanding on the church. And they just love this guy to death. And they are loving him to death because he's dying in his sins. Look. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 to 15. Yeah, I'm still nice because my wife keeps me nice. If it wasn't for that girl, I'd run roughshod over some people who need somebody to run roughshod over them. Right now, she's holding me back. I want to giddy up, giddy up, but she's saying, Colin, 
you're better than this. <laughs> Colin, you took years to build up your good reputation. Don't throw it away behind this little non-entity of a person. Colin, behave yourself. And she looked at me so sweet and nice. What can I do? I'm in love. <laughs> the queen of Zamunda. <laughs> boy, she just knows how to calm a brother down. Down, boy, down, boy, down, boy. And this time Rover is ready to run and bite some of these rascals that come in plundering the kingdom. Arr! Who let them dogs out? <laughs> and she told her, she, she gave a dog a bone up in here. She said, Gene, you know about that, right? <laughs> Woo -wee. I think that, you know, the Lord put you with some right people sometimes. The two of us can't have a raging temper. Somebody has to calm the other one down. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. Give me about 10 more minutes. For such are false apostles. 2 Corinthians, 13, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. For such are false apostles. So they are false apostles. Deceitful workers. Transforming them. Transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. They were not made by the Holy Spirit nor called by God. They transformed themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder. But Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. They're going to die in the flesh and go to hell. These scriptures alone should be enough so that we can know that some are called to be And every true call to be apostle would have to have the right attitude. They have to have the right attributes. They have to have the right actions that God will require in his last day apostle. And so I'm doing this teaching so we can get it right at go and don't have to be correcting stuff along the way. Y'all keep this teaching, put it aside, hide it, tuck it away somewhere so they can't delete it. Are you feeling it, brother? I'm giving you a hint here now. You're supposed to be doing that right now. Glory to God. Let me repeat myself. These scriptures alone should be enough to make every true called to be apostle want to have the right attitude, the right attribute, the right action that God will require in his last day apostles because they're rising like a phoenix. Ain't no stopping us now. We're on the move. Ain't no stopping us now. We're on the move. You're not going to stop us, apostles. We're on the move and we're coming in hot. Mondo. We're on the move. And we're coming in hot. Every movement has its extremes. That's why you need balance. Every movement, every move of God have its, has its extremes. And the apostolic movement, if it's not geared up for balance, will have its extremes as well. There will be a few extremes. They will normally be caused by immature people. Ambitious novices. Novice being Johnny come lately. They're not seasoned in the scripture. They haven't been in church long. These extremes will be caused by immature they're young in the job. Ambitious. And when it says ambitious, the, the word ambitious is not used in the, in the nice te tense here. In a nice context. It means those are overbearing and hurrying to be in charge. Ambitious novices and leaders who are wrongly motivated. They're motivated by greed, by a desire for popularity. Those who have made in-depth studies of the human temperament you know that most people love followers. They want to lead. And they want to dominate. They want to have absolute power and control over the people. Most people who aspire to leadership want to have absolute mastery over the people. And I've seen a lot of humble men get destroyed once they become superintendent. Once they become overseer. Once they become district pastor. Once they become the big leader. They just can't handle it. Because their arrogance 
and their pomposity is bigger than the anointing that they carry and it overwhelms them and because they are a novice because they are young in the thing they can't handle promotion anybody who cannot handle promotion is young uh, you could be in church 30 years and still not know 30 things because you weren't paying attention years in church doesn't mean maturity in christ i just said a mouthful right there i'm not going to repeat myself on that but that was too deep the few ministers who have never allowed themselves to be sanctified by god will quickly accept that they are superior as an apostle and they have absolute authority over others why do they have this feeling because they have not allowed the Lord to sanctify them. They are unsanctified. They are saved, but they are not sanctified. They are not set apart. They are not consecrated. They are 25-year-old babes in Christ. 30-year-old babies in Christ. Leading churches and their babes in Christ. Such a person will quickly proclaim himself as apostle of the city, of the region. And egotistically want everybody to follow their every whim and fancy and everybody must submit to them the minute you notice an obnoxious behavior in a pastor are you in and do not submit yourself to an immoral minister if you cut the root the bad fruit will disappear if you cut the root the bad fruit will disappear most ministers are concerned about self-preservation and the roof above their heads. They don't care about anything else once they get that paycheck. The old apostolic concept of the apostle not submitting to any pastor, any teacher, any evangelist, but everybody must submit to him, is rooted in self rather than in kingdom principles. So I'm going to say that again. The old apostolic concept, the old school brethren that came before us, their concept of the apostle was rooted in self rather than in kingdom principles. And they moved and flowed in arrogance as opposed to humility. If we can keep the human ego and pride out of it, if we can keep these extremes out of it, the work of God will go forward with might and power, with signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost in a manner that we have never seen. We will not break rank. And we will not love our lives unto death because we are more in love with Jesus than we are in love with self, self-aggrandizement and a few dollar dollar bills, y'all. Therefore, in conclusion, we who are called to be and are now apostles, we need to concentrate on serving and ministering to the saints. You hear, brother? We need to concentrate on upholding and building them into the building that God wants them to be in. We need to remember the apostles and prophets are not the roof and pinnacle and top of the building, but they are the foundation upon which the building is built. You have never seen a foundation on top of the roof. All of these apostles and prophets who want to be seen, no building's foundation is ever seen. Everything sits on top of that and the foundation is always out of sight. I really question your apostolicity and your prophetic gift if you want to be seen. Because the foundation of the building is never seen. It's always covered up. It's deep. It holds everything up. But it's out of sight. We got too many apostles who claim to be foundation, but they are in view, they are in sight, and they are the only thing in view. You are not a foundation if that's your behavior. And it doesn't qualify you to be an apostle. You might most likely be a shyster. Give me a minute. I'll be back. This is the first time ever that my phone is telling me that I'm running out of juice. We were on a good while, over an hour and a half.
But it's bare saying, and I just got to complete this subject tonight. The apostles and prophets I was saying before I was rudely interrupted are the foundation or the bottom or the out of sight ministry in the body of Christ. We are not to lord it over the saints. We are not to boss other ministers around. We are to remain the apostle prophet foundation that undergirds the church, that holds up the church and stays out of sight. You don't hear the foundation complaining about the weight. It was built for that. Apostles and prophets are supposed to carry more weight, more responsibility, and not complain and murmur and gripe every single day. Once in a while, they got to let you know what's going on. Oh, glory to God. There will be talk about the powerful ministry that comes with the calling and commissioning of an apostle. They will be talk about it. They will talk about it. Because it's coming. It's going to hit this world like a church quake, like a tidal wave, like a tsunami. It's going to come with force. It's going to come with power. It's going to come with might. It's going to come with signs. It's going to come with wonders. It's going to come with miracles. It's going to come with gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's going to come with order. It's going to come with rebuke. It's going to come with reproof. It's going to come with teaching. It's going to come solid. It's going to come balanced. It's going to come with humility. It's going to come with love. It's coming and nothing can stop it. Nothing can prevent it. Nothing can hinder it. Let God arise. And the apostles, come out of your caves. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Come out, come out, whether near or far. Come out, come out, and shine bright like the morning star. Come out of your caves. Father, we thank you tonight. The word of God is quick and powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword and piercing to the dividing of soul, spirit, joints, marrow, discerning thoughts, motives, intentions of the heart. We give you praise for your work that you're doing in the earth in Jesus' mighty name. As you have seen on my page a couple of times, and I make uh, appeal to people a couple of times, that I'm building a church. When this one is done, we're starting immediately on another one. And when that one is done, we're starting immediately on another one. This will be an ongoing thing, and ever so often, we are, we are almost finished. We have the floor that was done today. The doors and windows are supposed to be put up. Then we have to plaster the inside and outside, run the electricity and the, the plumbing, and paint the building and get the chairs, yeah, yeah, rare it. So we are almost there. We are almost done. We should be finished in a short while from now. You can send some help if you want to, only if you want to. And thank you for sending some help if you want to, only if you want to. But I hope you want to. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Yeah, it's looking good. It's looking good. I look forward to dedicating that building to the honor, praise, and glory of God's great name. And then, as soon as we've done that one, I hope to be there to help to dig out the foundation of the other one. I've done this before. I can do this again. This is not my first rodeo. It would not be my last rodeo. Let God arise and the enemy be scattered. I used to be in construction, so I know what that entails. And I have the physicality and the physique to get that kind of stuff. I just like to smell my sweat. I don't know if these pastors can be that lazy. Everything they have to do be powdered and poofed and poodled and whatever it is. So send some help. Send some help. We are about to come to the conclusion. And we need this woman of God to get all that she needs to get. So that she can finish in fine style. And then on to the next one. And we've done that one, on to the next one. If each one give a little, a little becomes a lot. So thank those, I want to thank publicly those of you who have already sent uh, help, sent assistance, sent a few uh, blessings to the, to, the, to, the, to the cause of Christ and to God's uh, church that we are building. And we pray the favor and blessing of God will come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. 
And when your time comes to build your house, that the help that you have sent to God's house, that God will send help to your house. And it will be done sooner than at once and quicker than immediately. And for those that will go for loans, the loans will be granted at the basic minimum rate. And now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the throne of his grace to the only wise God, the honor and glory and blessing and power and majesty and dominion forever and ever. Let God's people say amen. All right, I'm in a thanking zone. Uh, Reverend Fonda Gaspar, you notice that my, uh, my ads that talk about what I'm going to be teaching and when I'm going to be doing it the next time, she is the one that's doing it. That's why I look so fancy schmancy. I just used to write ordinary words and, you know, people said, Rev, you need to up your game. And boom, shakalaka, the Lord answered prayer and she came along and been doing a fantastic job. And uh, at some point, we're going to put up a little address and a little uh, uh, PayPal or something like that. And we want to bless this woman of God who's doing that fantastic work. I know people will help. You don't worry yourself. God is a great provider. His name is not Jehovah Jireh for nothing. And so to Reverend Von der Gaspar, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Moa, moa, moa. We thank you, we thank you for all that you do on selfishly. In the morning time when I'm up and ready to rumble, she will ask, what's the, what's the subject tonight? And then I'll give her the subject. And then she'll put up all that fancy, smancy thing that she does. Everybody has something to do in this kingdom. We give God the praise. What I can do, you will do. I will do the yapping of the gums and the, the balancing of the scripture. And other people will come to under guard what we're doing. Send some help. And the Lord bless you and keep you. I, we will have a plaque with the names of the people that sent help. A nice fancy thing. And some people will get personal mementos that says we thank you for what you give. Yaya Riri. So the Lord bless you. The boom <laughs> is out. Have a good one, y'all.